<laughs> All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Um, so today it is my real honor to be able to introduce Dr. Brian Cole as our visiting professor. Uh, so Dr. Cole is a professor and currently the managing partner at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush in Chicago. Uh, he is also the soon to become chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Rush. Um, so congratulations on that future promotion. Uh, Dr. Cole is a real leader in uh, orthopedic surgery and sports medicine in the use of biologics. Uh, he uh, did his medical school at University of Chicago, where he also uh, completed an MBA. Uh, he went to uh, hospitals for special surgery for residency and then a sports medicine fellowship at uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, following his training, he joined Dr. Bach at Rush um, and has since developed a practice of uh, sports medicine, taking care of high-level athletes, um, and then a real focus on cartilage restoration. Um, he has um, published extensively across sports medicine. Um, he's authored um, over a thousand papers, uh, which is very impressive. Uh, but I think even more impressive and something that we saw in Journal Club last night is uh, the focus of his research is really looking at um, you know finding ways to change and improve um, clinical care. So uh, his, he's involved in high level research that really impacts our day to day decisions with patients. Um, he is an innovator surgically. Uh, he's involved with um, new technology. Um, he takes care of the Chicago Bulls. Um, he's current president of the um, NBA um, Team Physician Society. Um, he's a past president of the Arthroscopy Association of North America. His leadership um, just is endless throughout sports medicine. Uh, and then on top of all that, he's a fantastic teacher. Uh, so myself, um, Dr. Wong, um, we had the opportunity to train with him as fellows. Uh, he is an uh, excellent mentor um, and is an advocate for his trainees um, and does a great job uh, teaching uh, both surgical skills, but then also just um, how to talk to and how to take care of patients. Uh, so today, Dr. Cole will be speaking to us um, on uh, first cartilage repair and then a second talk on um, finding balance. And, um, and so, Dr. Cole, thank you. This really means a lot for you to be here and uh, uh, look forward to this. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, no, despite getting on a uh, four-hour flight uh, yesterday, it feels a little like home. I, this uh, It goes back, obviously, we've trained uh, two wonderful uh, individuals on your attending staff and had another one last year. It was just great. And so you guys keep them coming and uh, we'll just keep sending them back to California. When I was finishing my uh, my uh, fellowship at Pitt, I came out here and interviewed with Dill Cannon. Dill, does he come to any of the meetings anymore? No. Yeah, um, someone sent him my regards. If you, if you, whoever keeps in touch with him, but he's a wonderful guy and really meticulous, and stayed at his home and flew out a couple of times. And you know, Bernie Bach had offered me a job as I was a, a, a fourth year resident um, at special surgery, but I, you know, just didn't want to just I wanted to compare things and see what it was all about. So I came out here a couple of times. It was it was pretty great. Um, and I know you have an amazing program here, and I know a lot of the individuals here. In fact, last night I'm just thanks for. Uh, uh, obliging me and hanging out after the um, journal club uh, for for an hour just to catch up and have a drink that was very enjoyable and uh, mostly I had last night I had the opportunity with the senior residents we blew the budget so whoever's in charge of the budget um, I offered to pay they wouldn't take my money um, uh, but we blew right past that little dollar amount um, and uh, and I was still hungry uh, so. <laughs> So, but it was really enjoyable to hang out with the residents. Uh, that time is incredibly uh, satisfying and um, we just don't often have enough time to sit down and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So thanks for spending the time with me. And I hope that was of value and I'll remember last night uh, forever until I start forgetting things. So um, I was going to do, I'm going to do two, this time permit, not going to try to rush through it, but, you know, get done, we'll try to be on, done on time and have the opportunity to ask questions and, we had cases this morning. For those of you who weren't here, we went over two of two. We had a, two, a shoulder and then two knee cases, and uh, Carl is related. So I'm going to sort of tie together my thinking over the last 25 plus years of how I manage patients with cartilage problems as a sort of a, uh, an area of specialization for what I do, and give you some practical uh, considerations uh, because I think this is cross disciplinary. And as Drew pointed out, it's uh, this is the most fertile ground. The reason I gravitated to this is because we knew so little early on. And um, we didn't really have decision making based upon any real principles, or, or, or more importantly, science. And this is one of the most fertile ground uh, areas for translational research. Things that are easy to do, they're not expensive, and you can get answers that you can bring right back to the clinic. So I just, you know, I'm not a huge history buff, but I think 
uh, knowing a little bit about how we got to this point, you'll see that the cartilage repair is not a particularly old field. Um, the, the first person is in the top left was Pretty, who talked about drilling well before Stedman ever talked about microfracture and showed that we can actually get fibrocartilage repair. And this concept of fibrocartilage repair has been around forever. It's been talked about in the hip. When you do a hip arthroplasty, you see these tufts of fibrocartilage and so forth. So it's not new. We've known uh, uh, that there is some repair possibility, even though it's not normal tissue. And Alan Gross in 1975 in uh, Canada uh, was, had popularized fresh osteochondral allografts. Um, and they really became in vogue in the mid-1980s in the United States when tissue banking techniques caught up. Uh, Lonnie Johnson uh, is from Michigan, who um, was a, an amazing innovator. He had, intele he had intellectual property on, on shavers and blades and so forth. And, you know, he's one of these guys who just had a, who can come up with a solution for anything and had a very simple technique where you just abrade the bone, again, to, to get access to endogenous MSCs and so forth to form fibrocartilage. Um, Lars Peterson is not the only one. He's in the bottom left who was credited for uh, uh, cell transplantation. Um, Tom Minus gets some of that credit, as does Dan Grandy and others, who uh, basically uh, helped get the first cell-based technology through the FDA in the United States uh, and published in 1994, uh, the, a landmark article showing that you can biopsy cells, put it on, uh, just grow it, and then put it underneath a, a periosteal membrane and grow something that looked a little bit like cartilage. Uh, Dick Stedman, it wasn't that long ago in the bottom little, the late Dick Stedman, who I came to know over the years, uh, really described a basic technique that took from Pretty and uh, Lenny Johnson with abrasion arthroplasty doing drilling and uh, so-called microfracture technique. And then finally, Vladimir Bobak and a couple of others have described, he's on the bottom right, uh, the use of uh, autogenous tissue, you know, using a, a cartilage bone graft where you move from one part of the joint to the other. So this is it. It's not a very deep bench when you think about it. And when, when I think about when I was a resident at special surgery, the only thing we really had was the ability to debride or clean out a joint. And then that was it. And uh, it maybe gave some symptomatic relief and others it did not. So we're dealing with this uh, overarching, overarching problem of articular cartilage disease. And uh, suffice it to say, it's very common. Uh, the MRI may, uh, may or may not uh, over or underestimate the amount of disease. And if you tip young people in their 20s who play high-level sports, the incidence parallels what we see in people in their 30s and 40s, and it's upwards of 40% of having cartilage lesions. We've shown this in our, even our baseline data of NBA players coming out in the combine. It's just really common. Uh, I think some important tenets, and you're not going to hear about surgeries until I'm halfway done with this talk because it's, I think the principles are really more interesting and things that can take decades to learn, so I'll try to synthesize it down into something that's not too overwhelming. Um, but there's enough data now that suggests that these lesions can also have a pretty innocuous history and never cause problems. And I think it's important to understand that there's a lot of variability, but uh, the, the, the real answer is untreated cartilage problems will rarely cause symptoms. And that's important. We're just seeing people when they become symptomatic. The other concern, and last night I have a friend's daughter who is here, lives in San Francisco, came to see us at dinner, who developed knee pain last Sunday. She's training for a marathon. And uh, she's panicked because she can't train and she's worried because she had a meniscectomy that if she continues to train that she's going to get progressive progression or disease. What's fascinating is that other than obesity and trauma and maybe previous surgery, it's very hard to find data that says that exposure to high level activity will cause disease progression. Why is that important? One of our, my number one second opinions is someone who comes in, they're tearful, uh, that they say, look, I was told not to run anymore, not to do A, B, and C because I have this problem. And what's interesting is uh, that's not a very evidence-based decision to say you need to give this up. Intuitively, you'll see potentially an uptick in symptoms, but it's not necessarily associated with progression disease. Said another way, these people will not necessarily end up somewhere different than they otherwise would end up if they stopped doing exercise. Does that make sense? So I think it's important just from the, from the context of managing people. We don't really understand why people hurt. Uh, from a soft tissue perspective, um, Scott Dye, these are, you guys are just, you, we keep getting older, you guys are just keep getting younger. So probably you've never even heard of Scott Dye, but Scott did this, uh, really interesting study with his son. who was ortho, another, it was also an orthopedic surgeon where he had his son scope his knee, uh, with no, anest with no anesthesia. Okay. I mean, he, uh, who knows Scott, Scott, Dye? you don't see that much. Okay. Scott is a little, he, he's a little like Chris Farley of orthopedics and, um, um, yeah, very passionate. And, um, anyway, he scoped his knee and he, probed around and says, where does it hurt? And the only place that really gave him meaningful pain was in the fat pad. And um, so 
uh, with cartilage problems, you know, we know it's a neural, it doesn't have nerve endings so far, why do we hurt? I think the reality is that it's, it's an organ problem and it probably has less to do with the cartilage and more to do with the organ and the osteochondral unit. And you're going to see this theme over the next 10 minutes of how, how the bone matters and the bone may actually matter most. Um, I, so tying it together, my, my decision-making, it's very nonlinear. It doesn't involve, Hey, MRI shows a patella defect that has some edema scope, do something. Um, we, or do something because this joint is going to go downhill. So we're doing it in a preventative or disease modifying way. Um, I, there's enough th people to treat that. I think I'll basically stick the, mostly for what I do for the here and now. In other words, people who are impaired with sufficient pain and disability today not because of what might happen tomorrow. So I always ask a patient what they'd like to see happen. And many of these patients have had previous surgeries. So knowing the surgeries they've had and the response to that treatment is incredibly important to make a decision going forward. And then the obvious one, which rarely is forgotten anymore, is this concept of concomitant pathology. These defects, cartilage problems, don't live in isolation. They often have other things like malalignment and meniscal deficiency that it, you, it's hard to get a successful outcome unless those are addressed. And probably the most important thing is that there just is a really poor correlation of what we see on imaging and how people feel. And that's, that's something that's ubiquitous in our entire space is the lack of, uh, uh, of, of uh, direct uh, cause and effect based on what we get with imaging. The more sensitive the imaging test, the further away we are going to be from actually correlating our findings with what people tell us. So that's why it leads to this concept of skillful neglect. And I talk a lot about this, uh, where, you know, it was, uh, uh, Voltaire says, look, the art of medicine consists in abusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Okay. This is probably the most important slide that, that I, I, at least that I believe in what I talk about, because, you know, this concept of doing nothing is pretty foreign. And the earlier you're on your career, that's just counter to what your, your instinct is. We've got to do something. Like you just always feel you got to do something when the patient walks in the office. Otherwise you haven't done your job. And um, what, what's really fascinating is that patient symptoms kind of regress to the mean. If we were to ask a patient with low back pain every month how they felt, you'll get a, two or three months where they have nothing, maybe six to eight months, but they show up in our office in their most symptomatic worst state, right? So we're, we're really victims of our own environment. And I just want to help you just expand your, your ideologic thinking in this to the extent that People have a lot of waxing and waning of symptoms, and our job is not to stomp out disease and get rid of every pathologic abnormality, but rather to improve. We're not on this earth forever, so we're trying to build windows in time, which is to eliminate or reduce pain and improve function. And sometimes skillful neglect is an option, especially when we don't know the natural history of all these problems. Now, there is an argument that people make. They say, look, if you ignore it, these cartilage defects, they may get bigger, so we got to treat them now. And there's one study recently published that you know, from a corporate perspective, they love to lean on this study that they showed a very small increase in defect size, but other defects still developed in these knees. And these, the increasing defect size over time was not correlated with increasing symptoms. Now I, we, we working in, in professional sports, we, we get MRIs before people get injured. Right. So, so you, you can't get an MRI fast enough. And so this is a very high level athlete who's some would know, but I'm not going to say his name, but, um, he had, we were following him for this vague medial knee pain, has that lesion in nine of 22 um, that was not causing symptoms. It, he had that same lesion in 2018 when he had a meniscectomy done. And uh, before our eyes, his symptoms evolved towards weight bearing pain and got an MRI with very short time frame, And you start to see he's getting delamination there. But he had been existing with that MRI on the left since 2018. So things can change and it depends on the objectivity of your assessment if it's going to, you can actually pick it up along the way. Um, we talked a bit about in the cases this morning about load. Load really matters. Uh, uh, load, you know, patients who are in your, in your exam or sitting on the table who are not moving shouldn't really have pain, right? But they jump off the exam table, they walk on level ground, they have a little more pain, they go up and downstairs, they have more pain. And uh, most of what we do that's effective actually is load sharing. Okay. So osteotomies, metal and plastic, osteochondral allografts, they share un 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 loader braces, maybe orthotics. They help us reduce load. So load reduction is, our, is, the, is the one thing of a couple of others that patients actually have in their control that can make a significant difference. Uh, chronology and decision-making matters too. We, uh, Tad Vale and I were just talking about older patients who have cartilage disease that's relatively localized. You can take the same anatomic appearing lesion in a younger patient, whatever the hell that means, that's like a 
I don't know what that really is, but I'll tell you that I feel like it's in the 30 to 35 year old age range because our patients who are 35 to 40 are a little bit more uh, vexing of a problem in terms of getting them symptom relief when everything else is the same, we do the same procedure, but you can still get it. And the point is that as we age, the physiology starts to behave more like osteoarthritis and the clinical picture of arthritis is much different than the near-term clinical picture of a patient with an isolated cartilage defect. So there's a lot there what I just told you. You just can't, we, we just can't yet match the same things, all things being equal that we give people up to say 35, 40 years old and expect the same outcome in our older patients who otherwise look the same. Does that make sense? Okay. Confusing myself. So, so then there's this issue of size. So a lot of the algorithms were based on defect size. Now it's probably more because of the limitations of technology in terms of small, medium, and large, but this is also about load. So what we have shown is that when you take a, a ratio of the abnormal cartilage relative to the normal cartilage of the femoral condyle, there's a direct correlation with how bad people feel when the disease tissue occupies more of the normal weight bearing zone, right? I mean, pretty intuitive, that's what you would think. This is a woman who had a very small condyle who had a marrow stimulation with pretty good fiber cartilage fill. We'd expect it would do well, but she didn't do well. And that, that looks huge on the right there. That's only 15 millimeters, okay? Just look at how small her condyle is. So the point is that, again, it's all about load. So when we spend, I spent the better part of my career trying to figure out ways to replace cartilage, the challenge is that when people come to us, it's just no longer a cartilage problem anymore in most instances, it's a cartilage and bone issue. So to just put a better surface on something that involves a bone may be very short-sighted and it's probably why my arthroplasty colleagues generally do, generally do pretty well in terms of symptom relief. Um, athletes in general, you know, these are not all high-level athletes, but they have some unique considerations and just to put it out there, it's important that we separate concern from disability because some of these people have concern but have no disability. Uh, and, be, and, and before we invoke solutions that take eight to 12 months before we allow them to get back to their sport, uh, you got to actually sort that out. Some people, if they can't have symptom relief, they're not employable. And that's very true in a, in a professional athlete, especially where their contracts are not guaranteed. But this even goes down to the collegiate level where young people, the only way they're going to school is with a scholarship. And so they need to stay in the game as well. Um, what we choose to do can actually affect the asset value of athletes. And that's another interesting phenomenon that we don't have to deal with in our regular patients. But in the small subset of people who, who are trying to play their sport, uh, we can actually have a big impact on their earning potential. Um, we do really well with activities of daily living when we indicate people properly, but we do less well for return to sport. So that dichotomy is really important because if you have a patient who comes in and says, hey, I can, my quality of life is fine. I can do anything and everything I want to do. But when I, when I run, you know, when I'm training for a marathon and I'm trying to approach the three hour mark, my knee pain is painful and swells up. My ability to help that person is very, very limited in terms of predictability. And then finally, when we're judging risk, especially when, you know, those of you are taking care of teams and they say, well, look, this person had this procedure done two years ago. My first question is, did he or she get back to play? Had they missed any time? Are they having any objective symptoms? Because if you get one year or more after some high-level college repair procedure in a high-level sport, you can usually squeeze out a few more years. I'm not talking 10, 15, but you can get some degree of predictability. So the answer is, look, they're higher risk than a person who didn't have a problem, but they've responded well to the treatment they have. And there is some sustainability in the things that we do. So the risk is relatively low, but you don't want to give long money. You don't want to give huge money, long money, if that makes sense. So we can use some of the, 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 the medicine and the knowledge we have to actually help organizations make decisions about people who have had cartilage problems in the past. Okay, so now we're getting into the treatment decision making. It was kind of fun this morning with the uh, case studies um, about how we make decisions. And this is my general feeling about who gets what. Non-operative is sort of the acute onset, performance is maintained, maybe their performance is compromised, com compromised but it's good enough and maybe they're even playing for something in a last contract year where they can't afford to step out for a year and get better because no one has any knowledge of how they're going to, what they're going to be like when they return. But when the performance is impaired, they failed non-operative treatment, which we use an awful lot of, and they're early in a long money situation. In other words, if it's a high level athlete who has a con three, five years left in their contract, who has the time to get better under the watch and the money of an organization, we sometimes pull the surgical decision earlier than we otherwise would, if that makes sense. So the point is a lot of people whispering in the system that have, an, it's not just the decision-making in these, especially with athletes is much more complicated because you're not just dealing with a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You have 
uh, you have a front office, you have a parent, you have an agent, you have someone on Twitter. I mean, it's or X. I mean, it's it's a much deeper uh, uh, confluence of decision making that's affected by other things. We use a lot of orthobiologics, which is I'll call corticosteroids and orthobiologics. So we do a lot of stuff to get rid of symptoms. And I'm starting to get key in on who I think is going to be a responder and who is not. And this is something that's subject to study. But the one on the left is the one who probably will be most responsive to something that we inject. And the one on the right who has weight, weight pain, and pain, or they may be on a line that says sharp localized pain who doesn't ache and can't predict the weather change. These are people who may not respond as favorably to injections, but might like osteotomies. They might like unloading procedures. They might like orthotics. They might like weight loss. Okay. Just things to think about instead of dumping everyone into a singular box. Uh, we spoke a little bit about this last night. We reviewed our article on PRP versus HA. My dominant treatment strategy is a non-surgical treatment for people who have arthritic type symptoms when people are willing to pay for it. it is a combination of three injections of high molecular weight HA and leukocyte poor PRP. And that's all I'll say. That's my preference. It has some evidence behind it, but um, I like it and I think it works. And I think there's evidence to to support that contention. Okay. So that's all about non-surgical and philosophy. And we'll just uh, run through... Um, uh, just give, hit the high points of where we are today. So these are all the things that we can do to our patients, okay? And um, as you move along that lineage, you can see the frequency with which these things are being performed. And um, it, what is often asked is, that, well, does it really matter? You know, you can do any of those things, and do we get any difference in the outcomes? And this is one article that sort of threw things upside down a bit, and they says, well, look, all cartilage procedures achieve 75 to 80% good to excellent results, so it really doesn't matter what you do. I mean, that's complete garbage because we we make this we our decision making is 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 filtered by a lot of independent variables so to say that every lesion should be treated with osteochondral autoreft because they all do the same doesn't make any sense but what i can say is that about 75 percent of our patients when they're properly indicated will be responsive and satisfied but that's not the same thing as saying you can do anything you want to them and, and they'll be satisfied okay so the, the biggest challenge that we have right now is that what we do, you know, there's some things that we do are, uh, Dr. Lansdowne were, and I were talking about the car from the airport last night, we talked about like an ACL. You do an ACL, they come in, they have instability, and but for the surrounding discussions and noise about osteoarthritis, they have instability. You do an ACL reconstruction, now, they now have stability. That's, I, I guess that's essentially an off switch to a problem. You pat yourself on your back, did a good job, you'll never see the patient again, hopefully, and everyone's going to be happy. This is not off switch solutions. These, That's why it's really important from a uh, discussion point of view to understand what patients want. I will always ask the patient, what would you most like to see happen? And if the answer is, well, I just don't want to have a knee replacement in the future, but I'm doing pretty well right now, they're, they're out of the office as fast as they, I can get them out of the office. Because I'm not currently advocating for changing in the, the natural history of this disease because we have such a poor understanding of what that natural history is. And to evoke uh, uh, holy hell on a patient in terms of rehab and time for recovery when we don't know with certainty that we're changing the natural history. This is not for all conditions. There are certain things I think that have a known poor history that we might invoke uh, treatments earlier. Let's just talk about lateral from Wakanda OCD. That's a shark bite that goes off uncontained, torture in the meniscus and the tibia. Those are ones you would argue in the absence of symptoms maybe we'll be more aggressive with, right? But suffice to say, a cartilage defect, we, we just have such poor understanding of the natural history. And as I mentioned, the ambient level of disease is so high that we would be treating a lot of people that probably will never have a problem, okay? Um, and that's a lot like what we talked about last night, the Rotary cuff. You got 7 million people running around with chronic massive cuff tears who have no symptoms whatsoever. If we really thought it was that important, we'd be pulling people in like mammograms and getting them MRIs, treating disease that may never see the light of day. So just things to think about, okay? So this is more of a light rheostat. In other words, we reduce the pain. Sometimes it shuts off and we improve their functions, and that's what patients need to expect. Now, this is this is when I first came into practice at Rush. Um, I remember one of my, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was trying to think of like, I don't know why, this, you know, when your brain can't shut off, and I'm like, this is so confusing to me, and I, nobody really knows how to make decisions. The only thing we have available is debridement. We have CELT ACI, which was approved in 1994. We have OATS, osteochondral autograft. We, were, we had access to osteochondral allergies, but nobody really knew when to do what. And you're in the office, you're like, well, people ask, well, how do you make a decision? I had no idea how to make a decision in the first five years of my practice, other than what was my gut was telling me, but it wasn't based in science. And the only thing we had was this 
thinking of, well, it's kind of palliative, you scope and you clean them out, they feel better. Maybe it's reparative, it's an OCD lesion, you put a screw in and you fix it. Uh, and then maybe you restore the surface, very sexy terms, and we'll try to organize this in these buckets. But even that wasn't correct. And 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 when it, things got a lot more complicated, and I still think, I think we're further along now, but you can see the algorithm, the decision-making is much further along. So what I'm going to do is just try to give you some um, things to think about the signals that make you think about where you might do one thing versus another. Okay. And then you can do it on your own and see how things work out. How's that? So, so, uh, debridement and chondroplasty, debridement and chondroplasty, and we talked about this this morning is actually a viable treatment option. When patients, uh, have smaller defects with acute symptoms that are mechanical in nature, they can and will, will feel better, better for some period of time with debridement. So you just can't throw this out because we have other opportunities to do different things to them. Uh, at the very least, it gives you information about what to do next if you need to. So I don't ever tell people that I'm doing a diagnostic arthroscopy. I tell them I'm doing a diagnostic arthroscopy that might also be therapeutic, but I temper that conversation. Why does it work? Well, we, we, we first figured this out in a series of patients, one to one cell transplant. We're going to undergo cell transplantation and about 40 plus percent of them felt better at debris when we took a biopsy for their cartilage, right? So we said, well, there's something to this. Others have studied it. Then we did a bio, some biomechanical work. We said, okay, so as I said before, this is a situation where you can take a problem, bring it to the lab and say, maybe there's something to this where we created vertical walls versus ramped walls, didn't do anything to the defect, but the way the normal surrounding cartilage as much as possible surrounds the load, ensures up the load, that can shield a patient from having symptoms. It isn't the fact that they're missing cartilage is why they have a problem. It's the it's the implications of missing cartilage in the geometry and the anatomy and the biomechanics as much as the biologic aspects. So you got to think about this not as they're missing a little bit of paint and you got to put the paint back. There's It's much more uh, complex than that. So this is a, a high-level athlete with mechanical symptoms, um, very mechanical with mechanical painful crepitus, which most crepitus is not painful. And we simply do a debris and we throw a little voodoo in there. We put some bone marrow aspirin in there. And um, we did sort of an abrasion, but we didn't treat it like a microfracture. We just let him go back to sport. And indeed, he was back in four weeks, and he's never had a problem since, okay? So then we said, well, how can we predict who will benefit from a debridement? And so this is a study. We tried to develop the score called a search score. And I think, I'm not sure, I don't want to overinflate the importance of this. I'll just tell you that the general feeling in terms of who will not go on for an early decision to have the next second stage procedure, in other words, scope them, do something, who's going to predictably not do well. Those who would predictably not do well were more likely to have femoral condyle lesions, high pain scores, high physical scores, and an MRI scoring system called the Amadeus scoring system, whether it's the size of the lesion, the amount of subcondyl edema and so forth, and sclerosis. If they add it up and they're more than a five, they had about an 80% likelihood of saying, I'm just interested in moving forward now with a secondary tr treatment or transplant. Now, there's a lot of hidden bias in this, right? You know, I'm sure that I'm influencing the decision making in the office when I'm talking to a patient, unbeknownst to me in terms of all these other factors. But there is a subgroup of people who do fine with debris, and I just think you can't throw it out, especially in, with the absence of knowledge of the natural history of the problem. Okay, uh, marrow stimulation—it's still an option. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have uh, case series that have looked at marrow stimulation. There have been a number of studies that have been randomized controlled trials when we're looking at new technology like ACI that have shown marrow stimulation could be very effective. Uh, it's evolved. I think most people who still do it will are, are, have acknowledged that drilling is probably better than using a microfracture all. We showed actually that when you drill it, um, that there's less subchondral flare. Like you see the one on the left, what it all looks like typically by MRI versus the one on the right. So just getting access to MSCs, creating vertical walls, getting rid of the calcified layer, this can be therapeutic and get people better. Uh, this is a guard, a collegiate guard, a basketball player who had a long, narrow lesion, nothing really that I thought would benefit from debriding. Not a good one for oats as first line treatment. If it was round, I might do it. Uh, we did marrow stimulation effectively and the patient was able to get back. And I don't think he got back because it was debrided because, excuse me, there really wasn't a whole lot to debride. We still spent some time on low cost options to improve marrow stimulation, uh, which develops fibrocartilage. Most of my time has been spent on a procedure called autocart, where we actually take minced cartilage. Uh, it, there's cellular apoptosis at the edge of that cartilage. It starts to lay down matrix. So you, it's like a hair transplant. You know, if you could take hair, chop it up and put it in another place, that's kind of what this is. And it actually, in, in our animal models and clinically, we believe this is a low cost solution. It's especially uh, 
popular in, in outside the United States where cell-based technologies uh, get no reimbursement and they don't have osteoconal allografts. OATS. OATS is a dominant treatment strategy for a single small defect in an active patient. So that's the take home. So 10, 11 millimeter defect, highly active patient. If you need something out of the gates, time zero, take a plug of bone and cartilage from one part of the joint, put it to another. It has a very high likelihood of success, assuming that their pain is coming from the defect. Macy, still a good operation. So this is a second generation technique where cells are biopsied, cultured on a collagen membrane. It's a much easier technique to perform now. The results, even in high level athletes, are quite good. I think the challenge, this is just a bipolar uh, lesion where it gets a TTO with bipolar patella from a Macy. The challenge with a cell-based transplant is they just take a long time to mature and the variability in outcomes is broader than other things I do. So I think it has a role for younger patients with multifocal defects with healthy bone as a primary treatment, but I will argue that all day long that an osteocondral allograft is the most versatile, predictable operation we have for cartilage repair. So we've now we're over a thousand osteocondral allografts over 25 years. Uh, many of them are with combined procedures with meniscal transplants, osteotomies, and things of that nature. But um, it is a good operation, and you can get even the highest demand person back to high level sports. Um, this is one we just looked at this because I've been we're seeing a, an onslaught of people who have isolated disease, and we're trying to get a sense of in the highest level. So we're doing pretty well in collision sports. Uh, this includes virtually every sport, not a big population. So it's not like it's commonly done, uh, but it is done. And it's probably our best option or our highest demand patients. It can be done on the femoral condyle. It could be done as uh, Drew showed his case this morning on the patella, and it can be done on the trochlea. And it can be done with a high degree of predictability. Now, like anything else, as I pointed out, we're looking for ways to find a, a, a translational science that will improve our outcomes. So now, one of, much of our work is on 3D scanning, 3D CT scans, uh, looking at ways to, to topographically match the graft. We do pretty well with the cartilage, but the bone we're not doing so great. So we often see step offs in the bone. So we're trying to figure out the best ways now to actually match the topography of the donor. The problem is we don't really have the luxury to pick and choose. We still have a supply side issue. So we can say this is the perfect graft, but I'm not sure I can get it all, at all times. I've had some really challenging situations with some high-level athletes where I've actually had to get two grafts to, in case one was not right. It's bad practice because once you get the graft, you can't use it. You can't use it. You can't send it back. It's not like a meniscal transplant, which is frozen, where if it's if you're not going to use it, you just send it back to the tissue bank. So topography is really important, and we need to do a better job of, of, of top topographically matching, and there's lots of really interesting ways to do it. Graft integration is one that we spent a lot of our time and now what we do to improve uh, uh, graft integration, and we've shown uh, that bone marrow aspirate can reduce the number of large cysts that develop over time. So we also pulse lavage to get rid of marrow elements, but we use compressed CO2 to get rid of, um, uh, to deep clean the graft as well. And it increases the absorption of uh, orthobiologics like bone marrow concentrate, uh, which we think that's a good application for it. And then finally, we're doing post-operative or perioperative studies looking at synovial fluid, and we're actually taking that fluid co-culturing it with normal and disease cartilage and showing that once you get the joint healthy, the synovial fluid is healthy and that interplay is a, is a, is a healthier uh, environment. So it's not all about the bone and cartilage. There's a lot that goes on in the local milieu that has nothing to do with the structural aspects of the joint that are particularly important. The two comorbidities that are probably most uh, prevalent are going to be meniscal deficiency and malalignment. So post metastectomy problems are, are uncommon, but they're not rare. And this is a woman who is a, just a recreational tennis player and runner who six months after her metastectomy, where she had normal articular cartilage, ended up looking like she did on the bottom left. That was literally six months later. And she ended up with a meniscal allograft and an osteoconal allograft and did get back to most things that she had enjoyed, enjoyed doing. So meniscal allografts, as I mentioned, that's our second most common comorbidity in addition to osteotomy or realignment. And we do very well with meniscal allografts. I know you guys do them here. We talked a bit about it in Journal Club last night. It is a, this is an article we talked about uh, as well. And I think the take home, we spend more time now looking at why we fail. And we spend uh, a, a lot of time talking about what happens when you do fail, if you can actually get them better with something more simple. And about a third of these patients in the first five to seven years will require another arthroscopy. And about 65% of those will say they feel better after that simple scope without redoing what we did. We've also learned that you can actually redo these operations again We've also learned that new problems develop between the time you do the first one, so you have to address those problems as well, which usually means they have more cartilage disease by that time. 
And the final thing that I've learned is that if they go on to arthroplasty, they don't do as well as the native patients who go on to arthroplasty who have traditional osteoarthritis. So if I've got to refer them to the only arthroplasty surgeon I know is Tad, if I got to refer them to you, well, now you won't take them, but someone else, um, they don't do as well when they come on for arthroplasty. It's not probably because they had cartilage repair. I think they're just different patients. And I think we all know of patients that you can throw A, B, C, and D at them and they just don't get better. There's absolutely a subset of these patients who don't get well no matter what we do. So osteotomy is the lowest hanging fruit, we say, to get someone well. Osteotomy, even without cartilage repair, can be a wonderful operation to get people feeling better. In Europe, they do a lot more osteotomies than unis. Here, we tend to steer towards unis for a variety of reasons. But an osteotomy still is a wonderful operation as a complement in the joint uh, preservation decision making. So managing expectations is probably the most important thing. And this is not an effort to share all the great things we've done. I'm just telling you that I'm in an environment where I can collaborate just like you guys can. You know, we have a, probably a similar number of basic scientists that we can work with in anatomy, biomechanics, uh, uh, st uh, stem cell research, and so forth. And it's taught me a lot in terms of my ability to we have a really confident conversation with a patient in the office. So those of you who are sort of going through this process, if you're interested in academics, the greatest benefit is that you can't, you're can't. you not living in a vacuum. You're not making decisions on your own. You get to talk to your colleagues. Like, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Being here before you and having the opportunity to talk to you guys last night is equally, if not more satisfying than anything I do in my day job in my private independent practice. And that's because you're, you just feel like you can always be better in what we do. So surrounding yourself by people who are able to do some of this translational research to help you make decisions in the office is one of the most satisfying things, that, at least for me, in my professional career. So knowing things, knowing when not to do something and the placebo impact is enormous. We all have our own unique placebo effect. Uh, understanding the patient's cycle in terms of their disease states, knowing what leads to success and then probably, again, most importantly, is understanding why we fail and reversing the course of decision-making based upon failure. So if this is sort of the one slide that ties it together, if you say, well, how do you decide? This is my answer today in October of 23. You know, I debride first-line athletes in season, lower demand, nuance of mechanical symptoms. I use marrow stimulation or marrow stimulation plus for uh, weirdly shaped lesions that don't have a lot of bony involvement. Uh, with patients who understand that it may not be a perfectly sustainable option, but they can buy them time. I uh, use osteochondral autographs for the rare lesion that's small. Uh, I don't do a lot of osteochondral autographs. I don't see many people with small symptomatic lesions, but if you get that unicorn, this will solve it. Uh, Cell-based te technology is, as I say, young, young multifocal clean lesions, and then lar large, deep revision bipolar, subchondral bone, those get meniscal transplants. They get all get osteochondral autographs. Um, and then I just want you to think about this for a second. So, um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time talking about the cartilage, but with, this is a procedure on the bottom left. This is something that's under development where we're just using a, a silica-based mineral pin that's very strong, very rigid, almost like a rafter screw across the subcondyl bone in order to share load. And we now have about 15 patients that we've done this for, and those who have meniscal pathology and osteoarthritis who have subcondyl edema so it's a replacement for subchondroplasty, which I think we had a lot of variability in outcomes. It's just a simple concept that like rebar in concrete, where if you could shore the load up or reduce the load and create a load sharing environment, maybe that will reduce pain. Okay. Uh, other studies, and this is, this is on the right, a so-called Misha. I mean, it looks sort of like science fiction, but this is now commercially available. It's a device that is a spring-loaded shock absorber. I used to call it the Tigger knee. Um, you guys know what Tigger is? Win the pool? All right. Um, so anyway, it's a shock absorber that provides a distraction across the involved compartment. You don't even have to be embarrassed. It just provides a distraction. And you say, how could that not bother someone? How would they tolerate that in the subcutaneous tissue? They do tolerate it. So I guess what I'm, I guess I think the take home, the added take home to my talk is I just want you to think about how, um, it isn't all about the cartilage. Now, most of the technologies that we're dealing with that are on the, around the corner, like Cardiheal, which recently was approved, that's actually a bone cartilage solution. So why would a piece of coral placed with little plugs around an arthritic lesion make someone feel better? Because it load shares and it's inert initially, and they can feel better just like an inset piece of polyethylene, right? So it doesn't have to be all cartilage to get you there. 
That being said, these are this Atkalop from uh, Germany. They're five patients away from being fully enrolled in a 235 patient trial that'll offer another cell based technology, but they're going to have an uphill climb. It's going to be an economic argument. It's going to be a scale issue in terms of um, of uh, actually uh, uh, getting commercialized. They've been at it for 10 plus years, thousands of patients in Europe, nobody other than the clinical trial in the US. Uh, we're one of the trial sites. The patients actually have been doing fine. They do as well as other things that I do. Um, but I think there's a chance this technology after tens of millions of dollars will never see the light of day because of the economic environment that we have right now and the other things that are available. I hope that's not the case just for the sake of the company, but I think there's a very real concern that that's going to be the case. So there's a large incidence of cartilage problems that may never cause symptoms. The goals are to reduce pain and improve function. Skillful neglect is an acceptable uh, treatment pathway. And um, in, 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 unlike other things that we do that you know don't oscillate, this is one that symptoms do oscillate. And we don't know enough about the natural history to say that some things can't be ignored. And I can just tell you at this stage of my career, I spend more time doing the, doing less than I do doing more. And I, and I just want to impart that on the young people in the room because at this stage of your careers, you're really focused on doing, you know, you, you go into medicine because you want to do something. Um, but remember doing something isn't always surgery. And when you refine your practice, you're to the point where you're going to have predictably good outcomes because you narrow the pool. Uh, you can do it this, what we do for a long time and not get fatigued. And I think that that's important because, you know, if you want a 25 to 35 year career, if you really love what you do, you'll probably love it a lot more if your clinic days come in with people who are like really satisfied with what you did for them. I mean, that, that is a drug and that doesn't go away. And that, and that's a lot, a lot of substantial, substantiates a lot of the reason that you and I went into medicine. People ask you, we all give the same answer. Mostly your answers are no different than mine. Uh, I imagine you just want to help people. Maybe in the old days, in the old days, people say, I want to make a lot of money. Things have been normalized and we're living in a much more socialistic model now of healthcare um, that still I think people going into this are doing it for pure, much more pure intent and it's hard to get into, right? So to have an enjoyable career, I think that the, the, core, the key is figure out why we fail and get good outcomes because it'll keep you coming back to the office on a regular basis and, and hopefully having a very satisfying, fulfilling career. So thank you very much. So I wove in a lot of things for my second talk. So I don't know if I, there's a couple of things. We're not going to have enough time, I don't think. And I'm happy to answer some basic questions what I was going to cover in my talk, which I would love to, maybe I'll pull up two slides or three slides that are meaningful if you want to, but I would also prefer to take questions if people have them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a tumor surgeon, but I found it very relevant. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about saying no. So the skillful neglect, exactly how do you do that? That's the because best. That I is, love saying no. It, but how do you do it? So you have a patient, yeah. a lovely patient, an air quotes, yeah. normal patient. Right. And you know you can't make that person better, but they want surgery. Yeah. So I'll give you the, the having data. So, so first of all, understanding what their concerns are and why they want surgery is the first thing. So people have concerns like they, it's like a Dr. Seuss book, like they're concerned about the past, the present and the future, right? The past, because like, what did I do to get me to this point now? And they often ask, you know, I, I remember doing this and I think that's why I'm here. You, they can't change what has happened nor what got them there now. And I often diffuse that by saying, look, I understand how you might equate your current situation with what was traumatic, you know, how long have you had knee pain? Well, 20 years ago, I'm like, my eyes go back like that, you know, and it's just, and then you can, you just can't get to it. Right. So, so I say, look, it's more likely than not, this is a genetic diathesis or predisposition and where you are today, it goes back to a tool Blonde's book where he says, where, which is a great book to read being mortal, which is, uh, he says, we're all rotting from the inside out. You know, I mean, the collagen changes, water content changes, Rotator cuff disease is the best example. That is a degenerative disease, ninety probably ninety percent of the time. Meniscal tears in twenty-three year olds who have bucket anal tears, who shouldn't have a meniscal tear without an ACL, that happens in part because they don't have normal meniscal caps or tissue, right? So mostly disease is a component of degenerative phenom. So we're helping them understand that it wasn't in their control. There's nothing they did that got them here. Even if you 
think there were elements in your control, you wouldn't be able to prevent yourself from being here now. So that gives them some reassurance, right? Then they also want to know, I'm in pain, and what is what does that really mean? In other words, what's good pain versus bad pain? They're not saying these, but assume that they're thinking it. And they're worried that if they continue in pain, that they will be somewhere later on that they wouldn't otherwise be if you help them today. Even if they have no pain, they come in with meniscal deficiency or a cuff tear or whatever, or osteoarthritis. If you don't do something now, will my solution be different later on? And helping them understand that the same solution will be evoked later. My job won't be any harder. My ability to get you better won't be any different. We can. It's like taxes, pay them later. Let's do this later. And more likely than not, you're going to have long periods of wellness and this won't be an issue. And most of the world is in pain at some point in their life. Okay. So this is something to help them understand that being in pain is not synonymous with you have to be out of pain, but it's an issue of tolerance. And look, there's a ton of literature on, on, on how people catastrophize their problem. But the relevance of that is we also know those are the most difficult people to get better to ever meet their objectives, right? You can walk in the office, you know who you will or you will not be able to help. You, we all have that instinct. If you don't, you'll learn it. So part of it is helping them understand that they didn't put themselves in this position, that doing nothing is not going to lead to a worse problem later on. And it's okay. The number one thing is they want to know they can be, well, can I play pickle? Can I do this? They want to know that they can continue to be active and not make the problem worse. So some of that requires a little bit of understanding about natural history disease. So I do a lot of time saying, look, I'm just going to tell you right now, the first thing is if you want to continue to train what you have is not going to be made worse. Now, you may see an uptick in your symptoms, and if you need treatment, and again, not all conditions are like this, okay, but a lot of them are, especially in your world, you're dealing with life and death. So you have a tougher, maybe it's a lipoma that they want out, and you're like, you don't need this out, do you know what I mean? But in tumor world, you're saving lives. I don't, your, your decision making is a lot more complex than mine because, and sometimes it's easier probably because you're like, this should come out if you want to live. I mean, that's a lot easier than, that, 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 that's if you want to live longer. If it, that's different than us, that says we should do this so you can live a little bit better, because that is so subjective. So I love saying no. I mean, I relish not doing surgery because I'm so I do I, I'm really busy and I don't want to do any more surgery. And I would rather go to the gym at the end of the day earlier or get home and see my kids tennis or whatever. Um, so I'm fine doing less. But we were talking last night. The demographics of Chicago. We have six, seven million catchment area and. 30% come from the surrounding area. So there's no shortage of pay. You want to move to Chicago, there's work for you there. Okay. And um, I'm just, so, so my point is that saying no, and you, if you do a good job of it, you'll be behind in the office, right? That will put you behind, grossly behind, because it's a lot easier to tell people have an operation when they come in prime for that. Uh, but the satisfaction rates are so high and giving someone an injection, even if you don't think it'll work, but it might work. And in a setting where surgery has variable outcomes is the most glorious thing to do in my opinion, okay? And and then they come back and they say they tried A, B, and C and they really are, you. they feel better about their decision making. So, and then they tell all their friends and then you're even busier. So, so I just, I think that the art of doing non-surgical care is the, the most fun thing that I do in the office right now. The surgery is actually the easiest part. You know, it's re, and it's fun when it goes well. It's, it's so, so the not, the saying the no is understanding why they want the yes and helping to disarm them. That's my best answer. Please. Dr. Colville is fascinating. My name is Stephen Obi. I'm an orthoplastic surgeon here at UC um, with, with Tad. And um, I really enjoyed the, the comment you made that not all arthritic lesions belong to the same phenotype. Some are degenerative and some are the traumatic. And how do you differentiate between the two and then decide that maybe this should be an arthroplasty case versus maybe I should give this a shot with some one of those techniques that you mentioned? Because that borderline is where I have trouble. You know, when do I refer to my sports colleagues for a yeah. relatively small lesion? When do I uni? Anyway, you know where I'm getting. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of more margin. Yeah, so you and I meet in the middle um, where they don't have a ton of joint space narrowing but they have too much for me to make them better with what I do. And they have too little for you to make them better. And they typically are 30 to 45 or 50 years old. Okay. That's the group. That's our white space. That's the Nobel prize. That's the prevent it from happening category, but it does happen. That's the unmet need. 
So most of my patients are not going to, are not anyone you would ever consider doing arthroplasty on. Some are, but they're getting osteotomies. Um, and I don't do well in that group treating them like isolated defects and you don't do well in that group doing arthroplasty. So I don't even bother referring them to my arthroplasty colleagues who are so busy. And if they don't have grade three or more, no matter what I see, I, like I have patients who are bone on bone arthroscopically, meaning exposed, but they, their x-rays look great. If they don't have on a flexural weight bearing view, some high degree of joint space narrowing, I won't even send them my joint guys. I mean, I'm, I'm actually using geniculate blocks and pain, you know, I send them my pain people before, because I know they're just going to turn them away. Because they're, they're so busy with people who are good for their practice that they're going to help that they don't want my patients, some of them. Um, so so the way you distinguish is the obvious ones, unipolar versus bipolar disease. Joints, flexion, weight bearing, people come with MRIs, like, I don't need an extra an MRI. Or can I get another MRI? You know, they're, they're five, I need five MRIs before I see you. It's, it's a, it's a, it's the flexion, weight bearing x-ray tells the whole story, in my opinion. And if they have normal flexion, weight bearing views, um, and even with alignment, malalignment, um, I, that's a good, generally a good patient for me to consider doing something with. The narrower they get, the more contrapenic they get, the more bipolar they get, the less good I am at providing symptom relief. And then they behave, those are really osteoarthritics. The reality is most of the cartilage disease we are treating is actually degenerative. Like when they showed a cartilage defect of the patella this morning, that was really arthritis. That didn't happen when the guy planted and twisted, right? But he has symptoms and the good news is the only problem was that local spot of cartilage loss. And he was young enough that doing an osteoconic allograph is going to solve his problem. And, and, and arthroplasty isn't his solution. You know, people say, well, I have chronic knee pain. Can I just get a knee replacement? Yeah, you can, but you're not going to get better. And so my arthroplasty people, uh, you know, we have, you probably know our guys at Rush. They kind of know who they can help and who they can't help. And um, um, so we meet in the middle there. It's about age. It's about flexion weight bearing view. It's about the nature and qualitative aspects of their symptoms, achy, wet, swelling. If a patient comes to me with a localized cartilage damage and only swells, I'm really worried that I'm not going to help them. And I, that happens. I see that in some high-level athletes. I can't often do as good enough a good enough job to eliminate the synovial over response no matter what I do. So there's a lot more. It's a great question, but we actually have the same problem. We just meet in the middle. You come from this way, I come from this way, and we have this group of people, which is the biggest population in our country probably, that we're still trying to find a solution for. That's going to be injections, some kind of pharmacologic intervention, maybe a, that tigger knee kind of thing where you just distract them if they're not malaligned. Um, something that I don't know, scaffolds, things like that can probably help these people. But you don't need cartilage necessarily. You can put something else in there. All right. I think we are right at 830. So I think we'll look to wrap up there. But Dr. Cole, thank yeah, you again. You're so welcome. Thank you everybody out doing this.